Good morning, everyone. Um, one of the downsides to, to preaching two weeks in a row is that I can't make the same joke I made last week, which is that I'm clearly not Dave. But I'm clearly not Dave. So, so for some of you, you may be like, oh, no, not again. Uh, I promise he'll be back next week. He and Gretchen have had the opportunity this week to go and be on a retreat and spend time with the Lord and with each other. Um, I believe that they're driving back tomorrow, so they will be back next week. So in the meantime, you guys get to have a conversation with me again. I'm excited. I love, I love coming and talking to you all about the Word of God. I've said this before in, in other areas, but I love it because I don't have to come up with my own, my own thing, right? This isn't my own ideas. This isn't stuff that I've, that I've developed. I'm not smarter than anyone else, um, and I love that. It's so freeing because the Word of God gives us so much, and it's life-changing. And so before we get into our passage today, though, if, you're a, if, you, if you want a little bit of time, we're going to be finishing John 6, and so we're going to be in John 6, starting in verse 41, so you can start flipping there or scrolling there if you, if you need. But I was asked to let everyone know that for those who have been going to visit Pastor Gordon, um, he has officially moved, and he's actually um, uh, rooming with Pat again, um, so they're in room C207, so if you've been visiting Pastor Gordon or if you want to see Pastor Gordon please know that that has, that move has happened, and so he gets to be with his bride again. So we are going to be continuing in John chapter 6. I guess I should introduce myself if this is your first time, or if you're watching online for the first time. My name is Michael. I'm the associate pastor here at Crosspoint, um, and if you, if I haven't met you yet, I would love to. Uh, a big thing that I have in my brain is that everybody is my best friend once I've met them, so I'm always looking for new best friends, so p- feel free to come and sit. Now, the problem with that is that I'm terrible with names. Like, I'm just going to own that. I'm terrible with names, but luckily we do name tags here. So if you don't do a name, name tags, please do them because it helps me remember your name. Specific, it's specifically for me. Nobody else. Okay. So we're going to be in John chapter 6, and we're going to be continuing in this passage. And just to give you a, a reminder, right, we've put a week between the conversation that was happening last week and this week, but there's not actually a week that has happened in this moment, right? This is, this is immediately following Jesus' words from last week. And so I just want to remind you that Jesus just told them, just told this crowd of people who had said that they were looking for him for signs, and Jesus has called them out and said, you're not looking for signs, you're, you're looking for your kingdom of self stuff, right? And he's calling, the, calling us out of the kingdom of ourselves, calling us into his kingdom. And he finished with saying this, this beautiful promise of whoever comes to me, I will never cast out because the will of the Father is such that whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And we come into verse 41. We're going to read this, these 30 verses together. So the Jews grumbled about him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. 
Now, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, they said to, he said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go his way as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. I remember, some of you will be able to relate to this. I remember a few years back I had a, had a pretty nasty illness. Something flu-like. I won't go into details. We'll, I'll spare you that. But I remember being absolutely miserable absolutely miserable. And across the, the time that my body was taking to try and heal, to try and bring strength and energy back into my system, it was really hard for me to eat. Right? Nothing, nothing sounded right. Nothing sounded good. To use the technical term, everything was like, meh. Right? Have you ever really, like, nothing is like, the, that's the thing that I want. Everything was gross. And despite this, when I was sick, I knew, at least in my brain, right, I knew that there were things that I should be eating to help fuel my body, right? We all, we all know these things, the, these foods that have, have been passed down to us, usually by parents, when we're screaming and throwing vitamins under the stairs so they don't see them. Um, that's a true story that I did when I was younger, by the way. <laughs> We, we know that there are right foods, right foods for us to eat, things that are nutrient-rich. Chicken noodle soup. Everyone knows, I think. If you don't, now you do. Everyone knows. Chicken noodle soup, when you are sick, that is something that you should eat. And it's a good food. It's filled with proteins, some good sugars, vitamins. It doesn't take a lot to, to eat it, to chew it. If the, if the chicken is juicy enough, you don't even have to chew the chicken. You can just swallow it right down your throat. I don't recommend that, by the way. That's, that's not pastoral advice. <laughs> but but knowing, knowing that chicken noodle soup is something that I should probably eat to help me with this illness, I did what any good young male does, and I ate some pizza. <laughs> right? I went to the food that wasn't what I needed, but it was what I knew, it was what I wanted, it was something that sounded like I would enjoy it. Books, blogs, my wife, my parents, all of them would scream to me, no, 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 that's not what you need. You don't need more grease and fat. You need something that has better um, stuff in it. And we've all been here at some point, either in illness or otherwise, right? We even soften the language around, around doing this thing. We, we call it eating comfort food, right? Even just a week and a half ago, I wasn't even feeling ill, but I told Naomi, I was like, I just really want something like some comfort food, right? We soften that language a little bit. And this makes it really hard for others to, to you know, tell us that we shouldn't be doing that, right? Because we can't encroach on somebody else's comfort, Right? We, can't, we can't try and push them or challenge them. It's, it's not their health that's more important. It's the fact that they're comfortable. Right? And Jesus had a message for the world that was a little uncomfortable. And it was hard for people to accept it. And it wasn't new. Right? The Old Testament screams from its pages, not just pointing to Jesus, but loudly proclaiming the truth that we are sinful. We are sinners. And the sin of humankind has resulted in the, in the groaning of creation. 
all of creation groans under the weight of sin. And this is true for every, every man, woman, child, humanitarian, philanthropist, preacher, teacher, nun, self-help guru, and criminal. Every single person, flat across the board, we exist in our sinful nature. That's uncomfortable. We like our comfort. But we're all separated from God because we, we desire to live in our kingdom of self and not in the righteous, holy kingdom to which we've been called. And so while we're all desperately trying to leave a legacy where people will remember us so that we'll be remembered as more than a Facebook in memoriam page, Right? Jesus is telling us over and over and over again that he is the food that actually brings the nourishment we need. We have this illness called sin. And we think that the pizza of behavior modification can solve that issue. Right? We think that we can perform our way into healing. That we can perform our way into a right relationship with God. But the, the problem with this is that primarily, as a starting place, as a, as a starting block, God doesn't call us to do things for him. He calls us to him. He calls us to him. We are called into the very presence of God. We are called to the very person of God made flesh, Jesus. This doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that we are passive agents in the world, that we're letting the world happen to us and we're not working on it. We absolutely have things that we do, and God has asked us to do work, but that's not the starting place. The starting place is Jesus. And so last week we talked about this idea that, we're, that Jesus is calling us out of our own kingdom and into his, and this week I want to talk to you about the fact that you're called to have your soul filled with the very presence of Jesus. Your soul filled with the very presence of Jesus, and he offers this to you. He wants to give this to you. So in, in this narration, as John has been writing this out, the, this idea of the Jews is, is often used by John as a, as a group of people who are opposed to, to Jesus. And so the, the Jews have been depict, who have been depicted thus far are grumbling, right? The Jews grumbled about him because they, they are uncomfortable at the fact that someone like Jesus, who they're like, oh, he's just a human. We know his parents. We saw him grow up. Yeah, he's done some cool magic tricks. That's fine. But how can, how can this human who we've watched grow up be saying things like he's this son of man figure that we're waiting for? How can he be saying that he's this bread of life? How can he be saying that he is somehow more, more good for us than the manna that was given to us by Moses? They're grumbling about him. The Greek there is like this murmuring, this dissent. D.A. Carson, in writing on this section, said that the grumbling was not only insulting, but dangerous. It presupposed, it, it presumed, it started with this idea that divine revelation could be sorting, sorted out by talking the matter over and thus diverted attention from the grace of God. Some of us struggle with this idea that we think that we can reason our way to God. And I think personally that all of creation declares the glory of God and you will end up there. But reason is not the utmost. God is the utmost. And God exists beyond our humanity. But the, the Jewish people, sometimes us, we crumble when we have these uncomfortable truths that we're being asked to wrestle with. And so Jesus again points them to his, his status, who he is, right? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day, always with this language that's pointing us to his divine truth. Talking about God doesn't bring you to God. Right? Being drawn to God does. There's a lot of people who know a lot about Scripture, maybe know a lot about God, but they don't know God. This is, this is similar to like why, <laughs> why dating apps can be challenging. Right? 
we can learn a lot of facts about people. We know their likes, their dislikes. But that's not the same as when you actually meet that person. It's not the same as when you hear them laugh or maybe see that they never laugh. Right? Or it's not the same as it, how you um, see them look at a cute puppy walking down the street. There's a difference between knowing something about somebody and knowing that person. And we in our, our culture today, this is, this is, I think, amplified and magnified. We've disembodied our relationships so consistently and so frequently that we've okayed the fact that we do that to God as well. We're sinners. And what we're doing is we're looking for someone to give us an IV drip for this thing in our soul as we look for our purpose and our life. When God is saying, no, 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 I, I want to replace your bone marrow with me. We're looking for an oxygen tank to breathe life into us. When, when Jesus is saying, I am the, I'm the actual hemoglobin, I learned about this this week, I'm the actual hemoglobin that moves that oxygen through your system. Without me, none of the rest of that stuff matters. Now, some of you who are theology nerds, of which I consider myself one of you, we get excited when we get to passages like this because there's a lot of like theological meat in here. I'm going to throw some words out that, that may scare some of you. Don't worry. Um, we see things like talking about predestination, talking about election is the, is the doctrine that's talked about. We see this um, invitation, right? This free will voluntarism referenced. And I'm going to be honest, all of you, all of you theology nerds might be a little sad at me because I'm not going to spend today talking about it. I don't actually think that that's what's important in this passage. What's happening in this passage, in the whole scheme of this, is Jesus is saying over and over and over again, this is how you're spiritually healed. You come to me. And he, he tells us, he tells us how we come to him. He tells us this. He tells us about how God draws us into his presence. But before we get there, I want you to remember that the entire point of John's gospel, the entire point, his thesis statement, out in chapter 20, right? These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we come to Jesus? Jesus is saying, no one comes to me except by the will of the Father. How do we do this? By being drawn to him. Everyone, actually go to my Bible. <laughs> everyone who has heard, this is verse 45, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Everyone who has learned and heard from the Father comes to me. Whoever believes has eternal life. And so here's what we know. Here's what we know. Jesus is saying, I'm the son of man. I'm the son of man figure. I and the Father are one. I've been given authority and dominion. I have resurrection power in my hands. And the work of God is that we, you and I here at Crosspoint, would believe in him whom God has sent. So God teaches us through the divine spiritual presence of the words of God. The Holy Spirit coming upon us, helping us see the things that are happening here. These words, the words in here are written that you might have eternal life. And Jesus says, everyone who has heard and learned comes to me. So how do you hear? By listening, Michael. Okay, yes. But how do you hear? By listening to the words of God. Listen for what he's saying. Sometimes we're grumbling so loud because we're trying to reason our way through things that we're talking over God speaking to us. And how do we know, how do we know when children have learned something? Bless you. How do we know when children have learned something? When they start to act on the thing that they've heard. This is what wisdom is, right? Knowledge in action is this idea of wisdom. So it's one thing to say that I've heard that eating chicken noodle soup is really, really good for me when I'm sick. And it's another thing entirely to learn and actually eat chicken noodle soup when I'm sick. I didn't mean originally for this week to be so filled with food since we don't have a potluck afterwards, so I apologize. <laughs> See, we, we have what we need to hear from God, but we spend so much time grumbling that we don't actually listen and learn. We have the testimony of Scripture. We have the testimony of our family and our friends who are believers. We have the testimony of Jesus himself, who alone has seen the Father. 
And yet so many of us are still sitting there going, oh, he, God hasn't revealed himself yet. He hasn't. If you want to hear from the Lord, if you want to see your life and soul changed, you learn from him, the one who created you. His word gives us the words of life. Are you going to learn from them? See, the, the consequence of sin, the wages of sin, is death. Separation from God. But Jesus comes, came, died, was resurrected, that you might have life. And in case you're unsure about all this, Jesus just continues this thought, right? I am, I am the bread of life, right? This is, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I, Jesus, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Symbolic language pointing us to the crucifixion to come. His body it's going to be broken, willfully given for the life of the world. Are you hearing God speak to you through this? Or are you grumbling? A blood sacrifice, a death is required for, for reconciliation because of sin nature. And Jesus is here saying, come to me because I am that thing. I am that atonement for the world. So he's calling you to be filled with the very presence of the Lamb of God, the Spirit of God, the presence of Jesus. This thought is maybe making you uncomfortable, or maybe you find yourself squirming, right? Wanting to argue with me or wanting to like run out those doors because I'm talking about eating flesh and things like that. The Jews responded the same way, these Jewish people. They've moved from murmuring grumbling to disputing. Machumai is the Greek word there. It means quarreling, fighting. This is a hard teaching. But Jesus doesn't back down. In fact, he takes this symbolism one step further. So this whole discourse has been going on, right? I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the son of man. I come down from heaven. I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. This bread, you guys aren't getting it. This bread of life is, is my flesh that's going to be broken for you. And these Jews disputed it. And they, and they say, okay, wait, 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 Jesus. How, how can this man give us his, his flesh to eat? And so Jesus says to them something that is blasphemous, that is offensive. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You are not called to be a vampire. Hear me. But it's worth talking about because Jesus spends the next five sentences repeating this idea four different times. When we repeat things, when we repeat something, it's, it's usually a big deal to us, right? He says this four times. But notice, Jesus isn't suddenly whiplashing us into a literal conversation. All of this has been symbolic. All of this has been spiritual. All of this has been focused on eternal uh, ramifications, on eternal life. And he's not suddenly like, okay, I'm gonna, you're going to get my pinky. You're going to get my index finger. And we'll have my thumb for Rick. Right? We, he's not saying that. He's not saying that when we, when we take communion, this is looking, helping us look to what we recognize as the, the communion together. He's not, he's not telling us that bread or that juice or that wine somehow magically changes into a, a physical body or physical blood. What's happening is Jesus is asking for us to be filled with his very presence. Taking communion doesn't save you. It doesn't magically bring Jesus into your body. But W.B. Westcott says it like this, that to eat and to drink is to take to oneself by a voluntary act that which is without, and then to assimilate it and make it part of oneself. It is, as it were, faith regarded in its converse action because faith throws the believer upon and into its object. But this spiritual eating and drinking brings the object of faith into the believer. Into the believer. Jesus wants you to be filled with his very presence Bless you.
This is hard. This is difficult to understand. This is messy. And the disciples, they thought so too. Verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? This is a hard saying. This is a hard teaching. This is a hard thing to understand. This is making me uncomfortable, Jesus. It's, it's forbidden to touch blood. It's forbidden to, to touch dead carcasses. Jesus, you're making me really uncomfortable because they, they are misunderstanding him over and over and over again. But scripture calls us to be filled with the very presence of God, which means that we become a different person as we partake in that presence. As we eat the spiritually healing food, we are what we eat, right? As we eat the spiritually healing food, the nourishment for our soul, our soul begins to heal. We call this process, the fancy word is sanctification, right? This idea that we are being reconfigured in our very selves into the likeness of Christ, which we were created originally to be. And this idea, I'm sorry, (laughs) this idea that Jesus alone, Jesus alone is the soon-to-be, in our narrative, is the soon-to-be resurrected lamb who was sacrificed for the weight of sin over the whole world, the idea that he alone is the one to whom we must go to for eternal life is a hard saying. It's okay to admit that. It's okay to admit that it might make you uncomfortable. It's okay to admit that it might, that it's confusing. It doesn't mean it's untrue. And notice in this moment that it's not the religious leaders anymore. It's not this group of Jews, this dissenters anymore who say it's a hard saying. It's his disciples. These are the ones who have said, I want to follow this guy's teaching. He's doing cool things. I want to consider myself to be under his teaching. And they're like, oh, okay, this is getting a little, a little, a little crazy. I'm starting to sweat under my toga, Jesus. See, they've heard something new. It's making them uncomfortable. And and when Jesus reforms us, reforms us, and shapes us into his image, it will be uncomfortable. Because if you remember from last week, he's calling us out of our kingdom. He's calling us out of our comfort. He's calling us to be filled with him. And Jesus immediately kind of calls out (laughs) this, this tendency to think that we can reason in any way, shape, or form in a way that is equal with God. Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, do you, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Spoiler alert, that happens. If you know the story, anyway. So, yeah. The Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. If you want life, if you want purpose, you can't do it separate from the Spirit. So are you willing to hear and learn from God? Are you willing to be, allow yourself to be filled with his very presence? We are constantly, constantly reaching, reaching for the pizza, reaching for that IV bag, reaching for that oxygen tank. When instead, We should be reaching for the one who wants to dwell deeply in the crevices of your souls. All that gross stuff in there that you're like, nobody can love me because I have this. All that stuff that's in there that said, if they only knew, they wouldn't talk to me anymore. Jesus already knows those things. And he wants to come inside and he wants to help you clean that out. And not just healing, not just suturing the wound. Scripture tells us that he takes our iniquities and he casts them into the depths. That's what happens when you fill yourself with Jesus. This is a hard saying. It's exciting, but it's hard. We see two reactions from his disciples. Notice the crowd isn't even mentioned anymore. We've moved past the crowd. There's two reactions from his disciples that are mentioned. God has effectively said where it says elsewhere in Scripture that that God can do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine, right? Right? In John 6, verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back 
and no longer walked with him. Is that going to be you? Are you going to hear from God? Are you going to grumble? Are you going to, instead of learning from him, instead of, instead of partaking in this bread that he offers, instead of partaking in these words of life, instead of partaking in the spirit that brings life, are you going to turn back and no longer walk? Or are you going to answer as Simon Peter did when Jesus turned to his 12 closest, where it says, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This teaching is hard. I'm going to turn away and leave. This teaching is hard. I'm going to seek those words of eternal life. Jesus is calling you to fill up all you are with his very presence. Your eternal bone marrow. Your holy hemoglobin. The chicken noodle soup for your sin-sick soul. And as you do this, he's going to replace the parts in you that are inside your soul that are hurting and broken with himself. Until such a time as he comes again to this world that he created and we rise together in glorified bodies. But you aren't supposed to wait until heaven to have life. The Christian call is not a call to heaven. We get heaven but that's not your call. Your call as a Christian, as a believer, or as an unbeliever who hasn't experienced this yet, as a created being, your call is to have life and have life abundantly, and you can only experience that with Jesus. So will you fill yourself up? I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Will you be filled up with the very presence of Jesus? As we end this section there's a warning verse 70 jesus answered them did i not choose you the 12 and yet one of you is a devil he spoke of judas the son of simon iscariot for he one of the 12 was going to betray him so even when we are disciples of the lord we have a moral responsibility we have moral agency with which we can work we can work upon this world and so we can choose to do that within our kingdoms of ourself or we can choose to do that by being filled with the presence of the lord and and seek his will ultimately but not everyone who comes to the lord does so with righteous or holy intentions or at least they don't necessarily always stay there right but we know that regardless regardless the will of the father always wins out because jesus isn't surprised by this right I chose you, yet one of you is going to betray me. But I'm not worried. I know where this story ends. Judas, like the group of disciples in verse 66, would eventually turn back when the going got tough. He would be a key player in starting the passion narrative where we see Jesus taken to the cross. He eventually gives up on filling him, on, on being filled in the presence of the Lord, even though he had that intimate, close dwelling relationship with him. Will you be filled by the very presence of Jesus? He's calling to you. Will you hear? Will you listen? Will you learn from the God who loves you and willingly came in the flesh to die for you? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us is ill. And the consequence of that, the consequence of our sinful attitudes, our sinful nature is death. Yet God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. That everyone who would call on the name of the Lord would be saved. Whoever feeds on the bread of life the bread of life that brought the words of life, the words of life that have eternal life, whoever feeds on that will have eternal life. And if we accept that call to his presence to be filled with that very same presence, the Spirit of God, as we think about Pentecost Sunday, as God pours out his Spirit upon his church and the believers, we become justified by faith made right 
with God. We stand in Christ's righteousness, not our own. We're given peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we gain access by faith into the grace we stand. Having therefore no condemnation in Jesus Christ. For freedom, Christ has made you free. Christ Jesus, the name above all names, the only name that can bring salvation to the praise of his great glory that we might all declare that it is not me. I don't do any of this. I am weak. I am a sinner. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us the words of life. Thank you for bringing the bread of life. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone in here who has not partaken in the bread of life, Lord, that today would be that day. And for those of us who have, I pray that we would continue to drink deeply of all that you are. That we would continue to decrease, that you might continue to increase in our lives. Challenge us, Lord. Change us. Make us uncomfortable, Lord. Refine us into the creatures that you have crafted us to be. To the praise of your great glory. And it's in the name of Jesus, the bread of life, the living bread who came down to bring life to the world that we pray. Amen.